All right, so let's go over these two problems before um, we go on to new material. So F, inventory records show an adequate supply of copy paper should be in stock, but none is available on the supply shelf. So the first question I would ask with this is this office copy paper that we actually use for the course of business, or do we sell office copy supply paper? Um, that can make a difference in how we process this. So for example, if it's just for our personal use, you know, in the office, most companies don't necessarily track that. Uh, you know, don't have you sign a piece of paper when you take one out. They just monitor the supply and order when needed. Now, if we sell it and we're keeping inventory records, then all of the controls that apply to maintaining inventory records, such as RFID tags or barcodes, would apply. All right, so B, receiving doc personnel steal inventory and then claim the inventory was sent to the warehouse. So one of the things is any movement to the warehouse needs to be documented and, they're, and the receiving individuals are usually the ones responsible for starting that documentation uh, with confirmation by inventory. So if it's, not, if it's coming into the dock and not being uh, documented to send to inventory, it's still supposedly on the receiving dock. So that's one of the, basically documenting all the transfers is your first step. However, there are other things. If it's going straight in, you know, from receiving to the trunk of their car, once again, some of the things we talked about in the last chapter, cameras in the parking lot, et cetera. All right, so our last section here. So I believe this is gonna be the last video of chapter nine as well. Uh, we're gonna pay for goods and services. So that's our last activity. So the first thing we do is, is approve that payment. Uh, this is usually done by accounts payable. Basically, they wanna make sure that we're only paying for goods that, or services that, we re, that were ordered and received. So basically, they're gonna match all the documents together and make sure that we would pay it. So really, it's a three-way match. What we wanna do is compare the, purch the, the purchase order the receiving report. So we ordered 10 widgets, we received 10 widgets, and we got invoice for 10 widgets. And the price between the invoice and the purchase order match. Then we would consider paying that. All right, there's a couple different ways uh, to do this. So uh, the voucher system and the non-voucher system. So non-voucher is basically each approved invoice is posted uh, into accounts payable, and then stored in open invoice. Uh, so basically 30 days from now, we will pay this invoice. So we kind of put it in a file to pull it out in 30 days. We write the check, the check is written or processed, and then the invoice is marked paid. So we are canceling the invoice, so we make sure we don't pay it again, and then store it in the paid invoice. Um, most systems actually work a little bit more on the voucher system. So uh, basically we check all the invoices that we could pay that day and figure out the amounts and discounts and prepare a list. That list is approved rather than each individual invoice and the payment is made. Now, most systems actually have a little bit automated approval system that we'll get into in a second here. So the payment is actually usually done by the cashier. So as I mentioned last video or last chapter, the cashier is somebody who handles all the cash, so incoming cash and outgoing cash. So the cashier receives the package or the list of saying that there's a three, you know, these three things are in there and authorize the issuance of the check. So the cashier or the treasurer then can sign the check. Now with systems, this is automated. Basically the cashier would review that list of all of the voucher or all the invoices that match the vendor and receiving report. 
I worked with an accounts payable uh, group that paid between seven and 8,000 invoices every day. Uh, so nobody was manually reviewing all of these. They were only manually reviewing the exceptions when the invoice did not match the purchase order or the receiving report. So you need to, I mean, kind of keep this in mind. A smaller business, definitely you would do this approval. So you approve the invoices and pay are the two steps shown on this data flow diagram. All right, some things that you want to do for efficiency. Uh, first of all, have your suppliers submit invoices by EDI. Uh, that's in their best interest too, because it gets the invoice there more quickly generally and process more quickly. Therefore, uh, probably start gets payments a little bit faster. The other way is to eliminate the invoice completely. And we mentioned this briefly in chapter eight, but we can have invoice lists evaluated receipt settlement. So typically before we pay an invoice, we want a three-way match, once again, from the purchase order, receiving report, report, and the vendor invoice. With a two-way match, all we need, does the purchase order match the receiving report? So did we receive 10? We ordered 10 and received 10. Therefore, we're gonna pay 10 based on the price of the purchase orders. Um, so once we received it, we're obligated to make that payment. Now, you don't do this with a vendor you've only been working with for a month or two. You do this with a vendor you have some experience with uh, that you don't need the invoice and somebody you do a lot of business with because it does take a little bit of system work to set this up. Um, most of the time, you're going to do this in an automated system that's comparing automatically and it will issue or recommend payments based on those two things. So one of the ways to eliminate issues with your invoices or data entry from your invoices is eliminate the invoices completely. Other things, procurement cards. So uh, our department in the accounting department has a procurement card for things that we buy. Uh, obviously, academic departments buy a lot of books. Uh, travel, everything like that. So rather than getting a purchase order for all these non-inventory items, we can use what we call P cards or procurement cards. They're basically credit cards, but they have some limitations. So you might not be able to buy electronics with this particular procurement card, or you may be restricted from overseas purchases. There's a variety of different controls that you can put. So basically, uh, one person has a P card for the department and um, collects all the receipts for everything that was made on that, that procurement card. Now you wanna make sure that you have budgets and receipts uh, to go ahead and, and pay those, you know? So we'll talk, if there's some controls later, we'll talk about. Uh, in general, you wanna make sure there's cash budgets and uh, you want to make sure that you're paying, for, you know, maybe taking the discounts if advantageous. And also you want to use electronic payments, EFT or FEDI, F-E-D-I, to pay suppliers. That uh, just eliminates a lot of cash controls that you need over checks. So some threats. Um, errors in the supplier invoice. Now, the first one is... It, you know, verify the mathematical. If it's handwritten, yeah, I would. Um, if it's printed from a system, that should not be an issue as much anymore. So it depends on where you're getting that from. Uh, for things that, for procurement cards, you wanna make sure you have uh, detailed receipts for that procurement card and, you know, make, and everything on that monthly statement should line up. The way to eliminate errors is to eliminate, once again, the invoice by using ERS. And then uh, only a few people should have access to the supplier master data, and more importantly, the prices that we are paying. And last, verify the accuracy. What did our contract say with that supplier of what they can charge for freight? Mistakes in posting to accounts payable. These are the same controls that we would use for posting to accounts receivable. So once again, our data entry controls from chapter seven 
and also a reconciliation between accounts payable and the general ledger account. Uh, failure to take advantage of discounts. Now, most automated systems will help you. You will define what discounts. So maybe we don't take a 1% discount for 10 days, but we take a 2% or higher discount for 10 days. So you can configure most systems to tell you what discounts you want to take, and it will prioritize your payments accordingly. Um, you want to be able to help have some system that tracks due dates. Most ERP systems would do that just fine. You want to make sure you are not paying for invoices that you didn't receive. So before you pay an invoice, whether it is an ERS payment or another uh, actual invoice that comes in electronically or paper, you want to match that to, once again, the purchase order and the receiving documents uh, to make sure that everything was received and we're only paying for those things that were received. For services, however, uh, you want to review your departmental expenses and you want to make sure there's somebody who is absolutely responsible for that purchase order of a service and signs off on it. Now, that doesn't mean it's not fraudulent, but you at least have that trail should there be a problem to know exactly who to go back to. Travel expense, ah, that is one of the largest areas of fraud and they usually call that the beginner fraud. Um, they've noted in one study, it was 60% of all individuals that mm, tweak it, you know, in their favor, a travel and expense receipt or a downright fraud on travel expense will go ahead and commit a larger fraud. So, uh, first of all, you want to denote what, you know, the people who are lying on their travel and expense reports, uh, get them out of your company because they're more than likely going to lie somewhere else. So some things um, that will help reduce travel expense, and there's, whole, we could do a whole day on uh, travel and expense fraud. Um, you want to require receipts. Um, I am required if I travel for you and I to have a receipt for everything $25 and over. Um, I could technically haven't done it, um, you know, a person with that limit could put several charges that are not over $25 on there. Uh, but there's not a lot, of, lot of opportunity because we get a per diem on meals. Uh, corporate cards. Um, I know individuals at other companies that uh, have found travel expense reports where all the meals for breakfast, lunch, and dinner were $24. Um, something. So, you know, they'd eat at McDonald's, but charge $24. Make sure your employees use a corporate card for travel and expense. Uh, so it's a card issued for, by the company. You can only use it for travel and expense for that company. You cannot use it for something else. So it does a couple things. Um, you, then the company just pays your credit card based on what you submit for receipts. So that helps have control um, and it's harder for individuals to fake receipts this way because it all goes through the cor corporate card. Duplicate payments. Um, making sure once again you have that three-way match. The other thing that can happen is if you have some paper copies of invoices, you make sure that you are um, paying only the original, not a photocopy, because you might mark the original cancel, but if you see a photocopy, you might pay it again. Which leads to making sure all of your invoices are canceled or marked or defaced in some way to show that a payment has been made. Uh, if we'd done the QuickBooks project, you would have seen uh, a big green paid when we paid an invoice. Um, in the SUA project, you're required to write paid on the invoice and put Ray Kramer's initials. Theft of cash. So similar, there are some things similar to what you need to do for your, um, for when we were receiving cash, but a little bit different for taking check, you know, uh, with checks going out. 
So first of all, you want to restrict physical access to cash, your checks, so especially those blank checks, and check writing mach signing machines. Uh, as you can guess, uh, we did not have somebody sit and sign 7,000 uh, payments that went out. Most of the payments were electronic, but checks that went out were signed by a check signing machine. And then make sure your checks are sequentially numbered. Once again, most systems will put that in automatically and accounted for. We also can have proper segregation of duties. So accounts payable authorizes the payment and then there's somebody in the treasury department or cashier signs and mails the check. If you have a larger payments processing department, you may have somebody within the department, but it's somebody who cannot process invoices. If you have checks over a certain amount, depending on the size of the company, you may wanna have two signatures. So an extra signature an extra review on larger checks. Restrict the access to approved suppliers and review any new changes and approve those by some independent party. And then somebody outside of accounts payable should actually do the bank reconciliation and outside of purchasing. We're going to skip over the next slide. It's on petty cash. Petty cash is really used so rarely anymore. Uh, we're going to just skip over that slide. So skip that slide. So EFT. So um, when you make an electronic payment, it's actually a file of several electronic payments. Once again, it looks like just data separated by commas and or tabs that's in a very specific format. So you want to treat that as a highly sensitive private information type of file because it's got everybody's bank number in there for all of your vendors. So you want to use strict physical access controls and logical access controls over your over that um, file. So everything that we talked about in the privacy and confidentiality chapter really applies. So the other thing is you want to make sure you're only making payments from a dedicated computer which helps you log which user and exactly where that payment is being made from. And if it's something different than that dedicated computer, which is mentioned a little bit later, you would uh, mark that as suspicious. And you can have some of your log analysis do that. You want to encrypt everything and everything should be time stamped and numbered, of course. You want to use what we call embedded audit modules or simple programs to, to kind of read through these uh, transactions and flag for anything that is out of the ordinary. So did we have two signatures or two approvals on checks over $10,000? Are we paying, uh, you usually have an invoice that we're paying. Do we, are we making three payments to this vendor for the exact same price? So things like that could be flagged as suspicious. I mentioned the dedicated computer already. And the other thing is if we have an account that we don't want to use for uh, electronic payments, so the equivalent of a checking account that we don't never pay electronically, we want to make sure that it's blocked. Uh, so ACH is a payment method. So you want to block it from all electronic transfers. Oops. And check alteration. So this depends on how you check, um, you know, print your checks. Um, you can have actually blank watermark paper and print everything, including the routing number and account number, which is made out of magnetic ink. Um, you can also make sure that uh, checks are imprinted so they actually have a texture to them. You can feel it's actually dots that are made in the check of the amount. So that makes it difficult to alter. Um, inks, what ink you use, uh, some inks can be washed off easily and rewritten in the type of paper. The other big way to prevent um, check alteration is positive pay. So positive pay is an arrangement you have with a bank. So every day, let's say I wrote out 10 checks. At the end of the day, I electronically send that list of 10 checks. Check one went to 
Amy, and it was for $532.67. Check two went to somebody else. Here's the amount, and you list all the checks. So when Amy comes to the bank, so when I come to the bank and try cashing a check for $1,532 and whatever sent, that does not match the list. That check would get denied and I would not be able to cash that check because it did not match the list that was sent to the bank. So that's a way to prevent somebody from altering the check and trying to cash it for a different amount. And then bank reconciliations. Uh, make sure you do those promptly. Once a month for a larger business is probably not often enough, but making sure they're at least done once a month. All right, I'd ask you to go in your book and look at D and E and come up with those answers.